Hello. It's so good to see friends uh, here for such a special occasion as this, especially for me as a president of the Heritage Foundation. And where did you come from? Oh, my word. As well as, um, as the chairman of the board of the uh, Gloucester Institute. Um, many years ago, when I first hit Washington, someone said to me, the first person you need to meet is Jay Parker. And uh, Jay took me to the Army-Navy Club, and we had lunch, and there began my uh, introduction to this town. The, so many of the people that I see looking around this room, I know he's had a profound influence on your life. And as the newly uh, inaugurated uh, president of the Heritage Foundation, I must tell you that one of my first official acts was to say, uh, as we are celebrating uh, Black History Month, I want you to know that I think it's important for us to celebrate one of the most important figures, not just in Black History Month, but uh, truly as an American. Uh, I thought about it this morning, and knowing my friend Jay Parker, he'd probably say, why do I have to be celebrated during Black History Month? <laughs> why can't I be celebrated any time? And the fact of the matter is, he could be. Um, I will leave it to others here this morning to talk a little bit about the impact that he's had on their lives and to the conservative movement. But I will tell you, I would not be the person nor the conservative that I am today had it not been for his guidance, his leadership, and his influence on my life. It also occurred to me that uh, there are many young folks in this town who don't exactly know who he was or what his contributions were. One of the things, and Winona, this is your task, and CJ, there is a tape that we did where we interviewed Jay to get his thoughts and ideas on film. Uh, it's very roughly edited, uh, but it is somewhere in the archives at the Gloucester Institute, and we need to find that. And I promise you that when we celebrate next year, we're going to be premiering that particular edited version of that tape. So your job is to find it, and then I'm going to get my heritage colleagues to help me to edit that particular tape so that uh, the generation who knew him not can know exactly who he is. Uh, we are so honored to have uh, his wife and daughter here with us this morning. Uh, Dolores and Ashley have been friends for years, and so we not only honor him this morning, but we honor you as well. We know the role that you played in his life uh, in encouraging him and being there as a support for him all these years. And uh, we know of your love and support for him, and so we want to honor you this morning as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to two of my heritage colleagues to share a little bit uh, from their perspective of the role that he had on their lives, and then we are uh, going to be truly blessed with uh, uh, someone I will introduce in a little bit who's, who's also one of my heroes, uh, and we are privileged to have him here as my, I think you're my first invited speaker at the Heritage Foundation, so you'll go down in history for that one. Um, so with that, uh, first Lee and then Bob. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, a, a day without Jay was like a day without sunshine, truly. He was always smiling, always impeccably dressed in a Brooks Brothers suit and vest with polished, and I mean polished, shoes. And of course, a fedora hat, always had that fedora. Jay was the master of PMA a positive mental attitude. Nothing seemed to face him. And we shared space and clients and dreams for over a decade. We were, in fact, the first integrated conservative public affairs firm in Washington, D.C. He was a natural leader. An 
And I brought Jay into the Washington Kiwanis, and within two years, he was the president of the most influential civic organization in DC. And he's a man in demand on the board of nearly every charity in Washington, Salvation Army, Goodwill, Columbia Lighthouse of the Blind, and his signal contribution to the conservative movement, however, was the formation of the Lincoln Institute and its journal, The Lincoln Review, which was filled with articles about the first principles of our republic and how to apply them to the problems of today. Just a little historical side note, um, the title, The Lincoln Institute, actually came from my wife, Anne. Uh, she and Jay were close for so many years, and she said, well, why don't you name it the Lincoln Inter Re uh, Institute? And he said, it's terrific. I like that. The Lincoln Review never had a large circulation, but it justified its existence when one Christmas Eve, Jay got a telephone call. Now this, he was there all by himself in the office. The phone rang Christmas Eve, picked it up, and this voice said, my name is Clarence Thomas, and I like what you have to say. And for 40 minutes, Jay mostly listened to Thomas, a legislative assistant at the time, the Senator Jan, John Danforth of Missouri, talked about politics, black and white relations, and how he, Clarence Thomas, enjoyed reading the review, talking about free enterprise, limited government, and traditional moral values. Clarence Thomas said, I thought that I was the only one out there. And it was the beginning of a close and enduring friendship between the young black lawyer who became an associate justice of the Supreme Court and Jay Parker, who was, in fact, the founding father of the modern black conservative movement in America. Jay Parker was independent, yes, optimistic, courageous, Gibraltar rock solid in his beliefs. We'll miss him, but we'll never forget him. Thank you. You can do it. I can do it. You can do it. Yes, he told me I could. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, this brings back a lot of memories. The conservative uh, renaissance of the 1950s was founded really by William F. Buckley uh, establishing National Review, but there was a whole other dimension uh, to this effort, uh, distinct and inseparable from that intellectual revolution, and that was the emergence of organizers and activists who engaged deeply and directly in politics and organizing and conferences and seminars and rallies and working the precincts on behalf of conservatives running for office at every level of government. <clears throat> Jay Parker was one of the key leaders of that effort. I first met Jay on a very cold, I'll never forget it, it was an extremely cold December night in 1963. Uh, it was uh, at a meeting of uh, the organization, a newly, it was a meeting and an organizing meeting of the Young Americans for Freedom at the South War Club uh, on the Roosevelt Boulevard. Uh, Dolores knows it well. Uh, and. Uh, this was an organizational meeting of the Young Americans for Freedom. I'll never forget the encounter. Jay was dressed like a Fortune 500 executive. <laughs> uh, 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 and he greeted me at the door. He was smiling broadly and uh, quickly engaged me in conversation. Uh, I was just a high school kid at the time. And uh, he seemed to take, I remember this, because he seemed to take a very intense interest in me personally, almost as if I was the only person in the room. Uh, Two things sparked his interest. Um, he learned that I attended Roman Catholic High School in Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, and as Bob Woodson knows, at that time, Roman was a basketball powerhouse in the city. Uh, and uh, Jay was an avid sports fan. Uh, he was obsessed 
uh, with sports, and high school sports in particular. He was also fascinated by the fact that my father was a detective in the Philadelphia Police Department, and Jay loved the cop stories, <laughs> simply loved them. Uh, he was, more than anything else, a real Philly guy. Uh, so he invited me to join YAF. I did. Our Philadelphia YAF chapter was largely comprised of mostly Irish Catholic working class kids uh, from, from North and, and West Philadelphia. Uh, but, you know, this, I know it sounds hackneyed, but it's the truth. The key ringleader of the Irish urban rebels against the reigning political establishment turned out to be a black Baptist from Fifth and Chunk in South Philadelphia. They say that sort of thing never happens except in America, and that is absolutely true. And I defy anybody to deny that. Uh, on policy, uh, the truth of the matter is, on policy, Jay was a fairly conventional uh, conservative. Uh, he loved personal freedom, personal liberty. He was a believer in the free market. He hated big government. Uh, he particularly hated waste of the taxpayers' uh, money. Uh, and uh, he was very much in favor. He was extremely patriotic in a very, very profound way. He believed that America should be the leader of the world, but he believed that America should only intervene abroad in its just national interest, and they were to be very clearly defined. What a lesson uh, he had to teach us. I could never imagined it at the time, but meeting Jay Parker in that December of 1963, I realize now I, I was meeting one of the genuine founders of the conservative revolution. And thinking back, it was his personal virtues, not his political acumen, that made the biggest impression on those around him. He was a very, very quiet man. In many respects, he was the most private public person I have ever met. Uh, I know that sounds strange. Uh, he, was, he was very complex. His personal kindness, which everybody recognizes uh, today who had the experience with him, was deeply rooted in a very, very deeply held religious conviction. The brotherhood of men is founded on the fatherhood of God, and therefore, every person is important. Every person is special, and the welfare of every person is a concrete and direct personal opportunity that he saw to do good in this world, preparing himself for the next. For me, his greatest gift was constant encouragement. He encouraged me to become involved in policy and politics. He encouraged me to join the Reagan administration. He encouraged me ultimately to uh, you know, go along and, and, and sign up here at the Heritage Foundation 26 years ago. My experience was shared by countless others. Jay was always there. Uh, Lee mentioned uh, Clarence Thomas, uh, who cherished Jay's encouragement and direction and advice, saying, Quote, I know that I would not be on the court if I had not met Jay Parker. I know it sometimes sounds a bit overly sentimental, somewhat hackneyed perhaps, but uh, the truth is, is that when I think of Jay and all those whose lives he's touched, I can't help but think of Jimmy Stewart's character. And it's a wonderful life. How one solitary man changes the lives countless others. The simple truth is this, for Justice Thomas, for me, and for many others, Jay was in fact George Bailey in real life. You can't avoid the question. You have to ask it. Where would you be? Where would you be? What would you be? What you, would your life be like if Jay Parker never was? The good news, he was. And that's why we're all here this afternoon. Thank you very much. I'll say it, were it not for Jay Parker, I probably would not be the president of the Heritage Foundation today. And that's why we're here to honor him, uh, because of the influence that he had, not only just in our lives, but everyone that's here. And I couldn't think of a better person to bring us our first Jay Parker lecture. Uh, just so you know, uh, my husband and I, uh, you know, when we said we were going to make our contribution to the Heritage Foundation, we decided we wanted to put that money somewhere where it would really matter. 
And so, Ashley and Dolores, we ask that the resources that we give go to fund the Jay Parker Lecture and Luncheon uh, every year. Um, and we could not think of a better person to bring that first lecture than another personal hero of mine, uh, Bob Woodson. Uh, I think Bob was one of, right after Jay, it was fairly early on when I first came to this town that I met Bob Woodson. And I was so encouraged to find uh, a like mine. I wasn't as odd or as weird as I thought I was. There were actually other African Americans who thought and felt as I did. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Bob was a former civil rights activist, past head of the National Urban League Department of Criminal Justice, and for many, um, and for certainly all of us here at Heritage, he's referred to as the godfather of the neighborhood empowerment movement. For more than four decades, he has had a special concern for the problems of youth and youth violence in America. So as we look for a pathway forward and we want to learn from our history, I couldn't think of a better person to bring us the first Jay Parker lecture than my friend Bob Woodson. Thank you. There's a uh, <clears throat> prayer that I utter each time that I speak, and as God give me the strength to tell and pursue the truth, especially when it's inconvenient for me. That the highest form of maturity, as Dr. King said, is the willingness to be self-critical. That if you want to go someplace you haven't been, you've got to do something you haven't done. Or as my grassroots folks say, if you keep doing what you do, you keep getting what you got. <laughs> and I want to join you with Jay. In fact, I think if with Jay, uh, when I first met him, we were one of five conservative blacks. We could all meet in a phone booth. <laughs> It's always a challenge to know when you're leading a flight or when you're a kamikaze. <laughs> That's always been the tension when you exercise leadership. Just, uh, and also, um, and when Kay, when we first met, I think it was your first week in town, and she was as, as, as bright and as exuberant and as passionate about the right to life and as the first black woman I've ever saw who was so passionate about the subject, she educated me on it. Not that I had to be recruited, but at least she gave some direction to that passion. And so we have been uh, close ever since. We fought for six months nonstop to get Clarence Thomas on that court. And so I'm just delighted. Just a uh, Apostle Paul said, who were you before you were baptized? <laughs> and that is, I, uh, I'm from Philadelphia, and whenever a, a, a Catholic person from Philly mentions basketball, I have to get up and talk about Overbrook High School. <laughs> I can't just leave that out there. <laughs> Philly is Philly, right? <laughs> I was on the phone, a little on the phone with this Catholic priest from Ar from Arizona, and I could just hear this South Philly accent. So I said, "Father, what part of South Philly are you from?" He said, "How you know that?" <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and also, heritage plays a very key role in the establishment of the Wisdom Center. Um, when I was leaving, I was five years at the American Enterprise Institute, and I kept bumping my head because I kept wanting to do things, and they said, no, this is a think tank. We just think here. We don't do, do things. <laughs> and so I had to leave, and, and I set up my own organization, and then the SCAFE Foundation at the Army Navy Club, Dick Larry, sat me down in a half, in an hour. He said, well, I'm committed to helping you. So he gave $25,000 to the Heritage Foundation to help me to incorporate. And Jim Larafeld was the lawyer at the time. And I was so impressed with the people at Heritage. Uh, Jim Larafeld is a very important lawyer. He became our attorney. 
And I was in his office, and it was a fine office. You know, everybody in Washington is important. And so I saw in the back of his desk this huge painting of this uh, grand-looking lady. And I said, was that? And it was Lillian Lerfeld. I said, is that a, a relative? And he says, oh, no, she's a, a madam. She runs a brothel <laughs> in, in, in Ohio, <laughs> in a railroad town. I saw it at auction and bought it. <laughs> and I just thought, <laughs> How self-deferential <laughs> and how refreshing it is to have someone who can laugh at themselves. But uh, so Heritage played a very key role into helping me to get that. Also, what I was impressed with Heritage is this willingness to tolerate dissent. Uh, when the first leadership for a mandate for leadership came out, um, I was asked to do a paper, and it was on the Reagan years, early Reagan years, and I wrote probably the only dissenting paper. And my dissent was that the Reagan uh, conservatives were defining welfare reform or improvement to poverty by just cutting budgets. I said, by cutting budgets and leaving in place the structure of the, of the programs, you're no more than low-budget liberals. <laughs> and so I have been on that tack. And then let me just uh, say that uh, by way of background, too, that I was my, 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 my the content of who I am is I'm a cardiac Christian, uh, and my political philosophy is radical pragmatism. I just want what works for the least of these. And I think that the character of the nation or character of any movement is determined by what are you doing for the least of these. And um, as a young civil rights worker, um, I became very disenchanted with what the movement was doing. In other words, I, I led demonstrations in Baird Rustin's town of Westchester. I led demonstrations for four months outside of a pharmaceutical company. When they desegregated, they hired nine black PhD chemists. And I asked these brothers and sisters to join our movement. They said, we got these jobs because we were qualified. I realized right on that a lot of the people in the civil rights movement who suffered and sacrificed mo most did not benefit from the change. From the very beginning, there was a bifurcation in that movement between the interests of low-income blacks and that of upper-income blacks. It was also expressed in the Atlanta, Second Atlanta Compromise when the question was whether black America should bus to support integration or whether we should strengthen neighborhood schools. I remember at the Urban League, I was dispatched to Boston in 1973, where Judge Garrity asked low-income blacks what they wanted. And for four months, there were town meetings all over uh, Boston, the low-income black community. And the parents said, we want to strengthen our existing schools and appoint administrators. The civil rights lawyers at the time, the civil rights leaders, said to Judge Garrity, forget about what they want, bust those kids. And as a consequence, none of the civil rights leaders or the lawyers had their children on those buses. That's been a consistent pattern. And so I just think that the, the, the abandonment of low-income people, the sacrifice that they have made, has come as a tremendous course. Read Bill Raspberry in October 29, 1965, when he said that uh, the, the, the civil rights leaders, the local grassroots people said, we are not represented. They're using the demographics on poverty. And when the benefits arrive, it goes not to us, but those who serve us. And this got worse during this. So all of this means that there is an opportunity Newt Gingrich said that the conservative movement will never be a popular movement as long as it's perceived to be against the interests of the poor and minorities. The question is, how do we change it? Well, one of the things we must do is we must seek a strategic alliance with people. A person's strategic interest is related to their strategic circumstance. Every tax loophole started as a tax incentive. And it morphed over time. As a young activist in the 60s, I was for central government intervention. Without the central government, the court, since we didn't have the votes, 
with the bayonets of soldiers reinforcing desegregation laws, we would have, I would not be standing here. So at so the, uh, the strategic interest of mine at that time was compatible with my strategic circumstance. But then as the strategic circumstance changed, your strategic interest shifts. So now I am against central government's interference because it has uh, uh, been corrupted just like the civil rights movement started as a noble cause, but it has corrupted into a race grievance industry. And so there is, as a consequence, what you have is a, 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 a degradation of that and the price that they're paying is a low-income people. So in other words, the strategic interests of conservatives are compatible with the strategic interests of low-income people. But we must, so we must have an agenda that addresses that reality. The second point of, that is central to the uh, point of mutual uh, support is the whole issue of values. We know that traditional value, bourgeois values are under attack by the left. And, but they are critical to the survival of people in these inner cities. Um, I think it was Samuel Adams said, a general dissolution of principles and manners will more surely overthrow the liberties of America than the whole force of a common enemy. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued, but when they lose their virtue, they will be ready to surrender their liberties to the first external or internal invader. For if virtue and knowledge are diffused among the people, they will never be enslaved. Uh, and, and that will be their great security. It's very interesting that Fred, uh, Frederick Douglass made the same point. And he said in slavery that the worst time on the plantation was the six days between Christmas and New Year's when the slave owners gave the, the slaves a vacation. But he says, the object seemed to be to disgust their slaves with freedom by plunging them into the lowest depths of dissipation. For instance, the slaveholders not only liked to see the slaves drink uh, on their own accord, but they adapted various plans to make him drunk. One plan is to make bets on their slaves as to who could drink the most without whiskey without getting drunk. Thus, when the slave asked for virtuous freedom, the cunning slaveholder, knowing his ignorance, cheats him with a dose of vicious dissipation, artfully labeled with the name of liberty. And the most of us used to drink down, and the result, they just might have supposed that many of us were led to think that there was little to choose between liberty and slavery. We felt that the very properly, too, that we had almost as well be slaves to man as to slaves to rum. So when the holidays ended, we staggered up from our filth of our wallowing, took a long breath, and marched to the fields, feeling upon the whole rather glad to go from what our master had deceived us into belief was freedom back to the arms of slavery. Now this is what the slaveholders did then, and this is the implication for what it's done today. Because the big myth is the kind of disarray that we're seeing in urban centers with the black on black crime rates, more blacks are killed by other blacks in six months than the 70 years that were those who were lynched. And yet, and, and the failing schools, but, but <clears throat> the left will tell us that that is caused by the legacy of racism, slavery, and discrimination. It is a lie. Because if racial discrimination were the problem, then between 1900 and 1950, black America should have gone to hell in a handbasket. But if you look at the third, 10 years of the Depression, when we had a, a, a negative growth in the economy, unemployment rate among whites was 25%, 40% among blacks, we had the highest marriage rate than any other group in the country. Elderly people could walk in their communities without fear of being mugged by their grandchildren. So that if racial discrimination, when there was de jure, we had five major high schools, Douglas here in Washington, and others in Atlanta, 
Walter Williams just did a study of those schools. And every one of those five high schools during the 1920s and 1930s, the graduates outscored testing all whites in those cities. When we were 50 to a classroom, used textbooks, lower per capita expenditure, but it was the attitude, the values, the value generating institutions that served as a, as a protection against the external forces of racial discrimination. So it is a lie that what we're witnessing today is as a consequence of that legacy of racism and discrimination. In other words, when white folks were at their worst, blacks were at their best. <laughs> and so up until 1965, 85% of all black households have a man and a woman raising children. But all of that changed. How did it change? Well, Cloward and Piven and, and the liberal social scientists at Columbia University, they said, you know what? We have got to bring about uh, a change in our system by compelling people, the government to spend on welfare. But there was a stigma in the black community about being on relief. <laughs> Y'all remember that, right? It was a stigma. And so there was very little welfare. And so right after the Roch Wyatt, Clowen and Piven said, well, one of the ways that we can end poverty is just recruit people to the welfare system. So in order to do that, they had to remove the stigma. So the first thing they said was that the bourgeois two-parent Ozzie and Harriet family was Eurocentric and therefore racist and an inadequate model to hold blacks to that. That position was joined by the women's movement who wanted to denigrate the role of uh, fathers. It was embraced by the black power movement. Even Kenneth and Mamie Clark, noted sociologists, embraced that position. But it wasn't enough to announce a policy. See, the left understands that you need a ground game in order to change that. So what the government did was open OEO offices and began to recruit people to welfare, actively recruit them. And they also had a legal strategy that welfare was defined from social insurance to reparations. And so that when the welfare departments began to have standards of who was deserving, lawsuits were filed pro prohibiting social services from determining the paternity of the father. And so a combination of actions taken, so within four years in the early 70s, millions of blacks flooded into the welfare system at a time when the unemployment rate in New York for black males was 4%. Because Clown and Pivot made this observation. They said, if we can just separate work from income, <laughs> we will make the father redundant you will see welfare goals go up, school dropout rates, and drug addiction and crime will follow. This is in their written document. And the contradictions of capitalism will be self-evident. And so as a consequence, you saw the, uh, uh, this implemented, and the outer wedlock birth soar, crime went up as a consequence, to the point where 70% 70 70 of babies today in the black community are born out of wedlock, when in the 1930s we had the highest marriage rate. That's what we, we, we did. And so the question is, and the challenge for conservatives, what do we do about it? Let's talk solutions and action strategies. The one thing we need to understand, because you may disagree with an organization's doctrine, and, you may, uh, and so they have strategies and principles associated with that doctrine, we tend to dismiss the, the principles and the action. But I think we can take some lessons from the left. 
that they have a ground game. Conservatives do not have a ground game. We are a movement of opposition when it comes to poverty. We're great. If we, I said, if conservatives were fighting the Second World War and, and planning the invasion of Normandy, they would have had naval ships and air force, no Marines and no soldiers. What we need is to join in strategic alliance with those who are suffering the problem, but we must develop an action agenda. My, my son, Jamal, like others, 37-year-old liberal Democrat. So we have interesting conversations <laughs> at the dinner table sometimes, but I try to avoid those discussions. But he said something to me that stumped me. He said, Dad, show me one thing in my community is represented by conservative values. Had to back up. I said, I can't right now. And so that became the challenge. So the question is, what do we do as conservatives to demonstrate? We, we, we don't need to try to win the argument. We need to change the conversation. We need to recognize that there are strategic interests. There are bridges that we can build. One of the biggest barriers that both liberals and conservatives have is understanding poverty and how to, how to address it. The first thing we need to understand, well, you cannot generalize about poor people. Not everybody is poor for the same reason. There's some people, there are four categories. Number one, people just broke. <laughs> you know, a factory moved out, death of a, uh, a breadwinner. With people like that whose character is intact, they take advantage of programs and their welfare is used as an ambulance service, not as a transportation system. Then category two are, is like the mom in Mil Milwaukee who was on welfare with, and saved $5,000 out of her benefits and sent her daughter to college. She was charged with a felony and required to return it. She said, well, from now on, I'm not going to save anything. Her character's intact. If you change the rules of the game, she will be fine and others like her. Then you got the third category, those who are, are physically or mentally disabled. And we've got to do something about that. But there are Appalachian families that will not allow a 16-year-old boy to learn to read because the family will lose $650 in SSI payments. So doctor, we've got to find a way to fix that. But the fourth categories are the one that concerns most of us. These are the people who are filling the jails and are, are, are terrorizing our community. These are people who are poor because of character deficits, because of the chances that they take and the choices that they make. Giving programs an opportunity to them injures them with the helping hand. These are the people that the, the Woodson Center specializes in, in handling. And so it is important in order for, for, as conservatives, what we must do for uh, groups like that is that we must overcome our, our, our elitism. You see, people on the left tend to look at all poor people as if they're category one. So we should just give them all money. People on the right tend to look at poor people as if they're all category four. And therefore, we miss each other when it comes to solutions. We must segment this and apply the strategies that work most effectively with that group. But if, if liberals are saying we need to give more government and conservatives are just saying we need to limit government, there's an old African proverb that when bull elephants fight, the grass always loses. This is a bipolar debate. We must have a different conversation. Conservatives, first of all, have proprietary interests that are compatible with the interests of the poor. Unfortunately, what you don't find discussed is the incompatibility within the black community. And we don't talk about that. That's like 70% of all the money, 22 trillion, we spent over the last 50 years on programs to aid the poor, 
70 cents goes to those who serve the poor, not going to the poor. They ask which problems are fundable, not which ones are solvable. So we have created a commodity out of poor people. And we have also included and made a class of people, it doesn't matter how compassionate they are, if their strategic interest is having people to serve, it doesn't matter how compassionate they are. You gotta change the incentive system. In the black community, two out of uh, 10 whites with college education works for government. In the black community, it's more like six out of 10 blacks works for government. So you have the black middle class positioned, unfortunately, strategically, to be in a position to need poor blacks to serve. And that is something I know is controversial, and I'm going to hear about it, but that's all right. And so the challenge is, what, what can we do? Well, the first thing we as conservatives can do is stop issuing failure studies. Stop telling the country that unless you're born into a perfect family, life is over for you. We must go into these communities and investigate what is happening among the 30% of the people who are raising children that are not dropping out of school, that are in jail and drugs. They are a source of new information, a new insight. But there are very seldom, if any, studies of resilience. And we as think tanks and others need to be, have a center to the study of resilience of poor people. So we can learn from those that are achieving against the odds so we can get valuable lessons. And, but we have a very difficult time learning from untutored people, both left and right. We, we mistakenly believe that character is associated with education even though the Unabomber had a PhD from Harvard. <laughs> but what, I, what we need to understand is that there's a new source of knowledge that we are missing. We're not going to get it by AEI sitting down with Brookings saying we're left and right studying the poor. It is important once in a while to talk to the people you are studying. What a radical idea. James C. Scott, I would recommend this for everyone to read his book, Seeing Like a State. He's a leftist, uh, a scholar at Yale. But he says that there is two kinds of knowledge. There's epistemic knowledge and there's metis knowledge. Epistemic knowledge is knowledge that you can generalize, academic research. He says it's like epistemic knowledge you can generalize about it. He says it's like a ship captain that's taking the ship across the ocean. You can teach that. But when that ship gets to the, ba the Baltimore Harbor, that the skills that it took to bring it across the ocean are not the same skill sets that it takes to park that boat, that ship, at the port. You've got to rely upon a harbor master because the harbor master has common sense knowledge about that harbor. That harbor master is different than the harbor master in New York. And so what is this meatist knowledge? He describes meatist skills are best cultivated by those close to the local environment those who have a strong vested interest in improving their condition, who also have access to the wealth of localized information in regard to how that skill will best work in their areas. Finally, meatist knowledge is not learned quickly. It grows from a long interaction between the bearer, the local government, employer, and the, and the skill sets. This long period of time allows the skills to be adapted to local variables. Scott calls that the kind of knowledge which has devalued by modernists and in some instances totally destroyed the meters. The Bible speaks about this also, about a source of knowledge. If you read in the book of 2 Kings, 
the story about Naaman. Naaman was the general to the king of Syria, but he developed leprosy. And a 13-year-old slave, Hebrew slave girl working in the home of Naaman said to his wife, tell the master to present himself to the king of Israel and he'll be healed. So Naaman gathers up gold and clothes and rides off. He goes to the home of the king of Israel who thinks this is a pretext of war. And, but the servant of the king tells Naaman, you should go to the home of Elisha the prophet. So he takes off and goes to the home of Elisha the prophet. Elisha won't see him, sends out a servant who tells him to wash seven times in the river Jordan. And he'll be clean. Well, Naaman is angry. After all, I am the Naaman, and you are sending a servant to tell me wash in that dirty river Jordan when there are cleaner rivers in, in Syria. But the servant of Naaman said, listen, and do as the prophet instructed. So Naaman washed himself in the river Jordan and became clean. And, be, and he says, from this day forward, I will take the earth of this country with me to Syria. And from this day forward, I will worship the God of Israel. Which meant that seven people, so, I mean thousands of people were saved. But who were the heroes of that story? Four unknown servants. And what, and what does Naaman do when he says, go to the prophet? He goes to the king. We go to power sources. We're oriented to go. Let me go to the smart people over here when I'm seeking knowledge. Let me go to the powerful people when I want to know how to proceed. And so the, the, the lessons for those of us who are activists and control is that the knowledge, the power, the information to solve the problem of drug addiction, of crime and violence, of despair, abides in the community suffering the problem among the meanest experts that are in there. And so what the conservative movement has to do, it has to join in partnership and learn to be on tap, but not on top. Let me give you an example of just one of these groups to show you how we can function. Freddie Garcia, who's deceased, has a ministry, Jennifer, you know, I'll cry in the video. Freddie and his wife were ex-drug addicts, and they, they, through their own experience, have touched the lives of 100,000 of the worst people in the country, and they were redeemed and transformed through their ministry. But they were operating all over San Antonio in little shacks, and I pledged to them when I first met them 10 years ago, we're going to build you a new facility. Well, Freddie called me one day and said, Bob, the state of Texas wants to close us because we don't have licensed therapists working. And we're using ex-drug addicts as counselors. He said, I don't know anything about politics, but I only know junks. And so what I did was I came, tried to meet with then the new governor, Bush. He refused to meet with me. So we had a demonstration of 400 ex-drug addicts on the Alamo in the July saying, let us go. <laughs> ben Kinslow from uh, CBN brought down his crew. Marvin Olasky had us on the front page of World Magazine. Uh, Chip Mellar from the Institute of Justice, he showed up to uh, and, and file a lawsuit. And I called my friend Ed Bradley. I was at Cheney with him. I said, Ed, he was working on 60 Minutes. I said, I don't expect 60 Minutes to do a story, but just call Ed and say, this is Ed Bradley, 60 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill Raspberry did a column on it. But the, as a consequence of this concentrated effort where all of the epistemic, uh, um, uh, the epistemic uh, forces converged to support what the local community leader did. As a consequence, the, the state relented and they passed a, a, a bill that, that freed the state 
from any control over drug treatment programs. These groups today face all kinds of barriers, but also we were able to get, uh, uh, recruit some conservative business leaders who put up $3.5 million and in three years built Freddie, a brand new facility. Right now, the left is planning to take what's happening in response to this opiate crisis. They are going to begin to open drug shooting galleries all over this country. They said a way you deal with it is just give people free needle. Even you can get heroin out of uh, dispensers. That's their secular approach. Why don't we take a lesson from the right to life where they have not just opposed to abortion, but said here is a facility where you can go and get counseling. That's a ground game. What would happen if we were to fund the Freddie Garcias and others that everywhere there was a shooting gallery, there was a faith-based facility that offered an alternative? And so we need to not only give get study success, but we also must invest. When President Obama announced his brother's keepers, the left put up a half billion dollars in two months. God knows it hasn't done very much for the people, but it was a part of a ground game. Black Lives Matter announced Ford Foundation put up $100 million for them. We need to be able to follow suit and have a fund to support grassroots leaders who are engaged in life reclaiming work. Call it a transformation and restitution fund. Because I'm telling you, the fact is that my grassroots leaders operate in cities run by liberal Democrats, and often there's a price to pay. When I took Bill Bennett and Jack Kemp to Newark, the local leader lost $25,000. So we really need to, in our recruitment, indemnify people who stand with us. And so the, the conservative movement needs to move out from its comfortable place develop a ground game, stand with, and not always have to, if you're very smart, you should not have to always be on t top, but be on tap. Amen. It's interesting, the principles of our market economy should apply to the social economy. In our market economy, we celebrate the entrepreneur, but we know entrepreneurs tend to be C students. <laughs> A students come back to universities and teach C students in Dow. <laughs> because smart people have to have all the answers before they act, and when they do, the opportunity's gone. <laughs> That's why A.D. Gaston, my favorite uh, black, uh, Alabama's first black uh, millionaire, at 103 years old when he died, he had a sixth grade education. He said, it's better to say I is rich than I am poor. <laughs> There's a lot of people who don't say ain't, ain't eaten. And so I'm saying that in conclusion is there is a rich reservoir of knowledge in the experiences of grassroots leaders all over this country, there are endless examples of hope for prisoners right here in, in Las Vegas, Nevada. John Ponder, who was, from, for the time he was 14, in and out of jails, came to Christ. In the last 10 years, he has a program where 2,000 men and women coming out of prison are in his ministry, but only a 6% recidivism rate. And 40% of his counselors are police officers. <laughs> so as a consequence, in fact, John makes, has a video. You're talking about radical grace in action. John has a video that his voluntary team is the FBI agent that locked him up, the prosecutor who prosecuted him, and the judge who sentenced him. He said, they saved his life. 
And so it is just kind of me this experience, this kind of unusual, out of the box way of addressing problems. We as conservatives need to harness that. We need to not only study it, but we should embrace it. In conclusion, I just want to quote my friend, or one, I must say, one think tank, the Wisconsin Policy uh, Institute, just set up the Badger Institute in Milwaukee. And what they did was assign scholars with professional um, journalists to really spend five days with John Ponder and do a whole feature in their magazine. So more of our think tanks need to get out from these walls and go out into the communities and reference them in your, in your writings. Because you validate them and they validate you. And let me close with a quote from my favorite from Pastor Freddy Garcia. When people are talking about all these secular responses to the kind of moral decline that we're seeing, if having just a, a two-parent household, well-educated, then why do we have in Palo Alto, California today, the teen suicide rate is six times the national average? And so the crisis that we're facing cannot be solved through lower taxes or, or a stronger economy. It is essentially moral and spiritual. And character is one. As Pastor Freddie, my deceased friend, said, if our problems in America were education, God would have sent an educator. If it were economic, God would have sent an economist. Because our problems are sin, he sent a savior. God bless you. I hope you can see why he was my first choice. I think it's a message that we all needed to hear, uh, but particularly here at the Heritage Foundation, where Midas meets Epistemy. Yeah. I'm Midas, our scholars are Epistemy. We'll get it together. We're going to make this work. Um, before we leave, and before you leave, Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> we want to recognize, a part of what we're doing today is also recognizing those individuals who are currently serving in government. And uh, we have a little thank you for you before you leave. Can I get you all to stand? I know we have Mr. James, we have Clarence, who else do we have currently serving in government? Want to thank all of you for your service now that you've been identified staff has a little gift for you. We're giving them our solutions uh, so that they can have the heritage guide for public policy as well as a small thank you note. Uh, I want to thank the Parkers for being here. We are so grateful for your presence. We want to <laughs> here, here. So we have Ties for the gentlemen, scarves for the ladies, and pins uh, for our political appointees. So if you all will come up before you leave. And where are solutions? I know we have those as well. Everything outside of the door. And Bob, I cannot thank you enough. I mean, over the years, the common sense, real, if we could just listen and learn from you, I think we'd be halfway there to solve the problems. And one of the things that I am committed to doing is to making sure, um, I know how tough it is for people who are out there providing services. I thought raising money for the Gloucester Institute was going to be the easiest thing I ever did in my life, and it's not. And so I know those grassroots efforts out there need to be resolved. Every day I pray that God will make more conservative black billionaires that will fund those things. Uh, but in short of that, I'll take a white billionaire any day, all day long, <laughs> who will fund those things as well. And so I commit to you that as I find people who are interested, we're going to guide those resources that way.
to get that done. It is so important. With that, now who knows what's next? We're supposed to have lunch. Lunch is outside, and uh, we appreciate your being here, and thank you for joining us for the first Jay Parker lecture. Yeah.